hello and welcome to episode three of the Crash and Ride podcast, a podcast dedicated to conversations with musicians and other creative people who have survived anxiety and depression with the goal of helping other people survive those same things. Um, I'm Patrick Ferguson. I'm your host. Um, today's interview is with Phil Smith, um, a drummer and working musician who's also co-host of the fantastic podcast, The Drummer's Weekly Groovecast, and um, he's a uh, my drum teacher and teaches tons of people to play drums. He's a really, really, really great musician and a great guy. And man, I'm really, really happy with the way the interview came out. Um, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that it was an easy day. Um, even this many years into me focusing on getting better, I have some days where I'm distracted and scattered and anxious. And today was one of those days. It had nothing to do with Phil. He was absolutely great and was a real joy to be with and talk to. But man, today was tough. Um, it's you know I'm finally finished editing the interview and I'm I'm ready to put my head down. Um, I'm back from South by Southwest. Uh, played 11 gigs in six days out there. It was fantastic. But I had a gig last night here in Athens and I'm just exhausted. Um, but uh, you know uh, it's been good and I'm uh, really 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 pleased with the response I've gotten to the podcast. Several people came up to me at my gig last night and said thanks for doing this. Um, I've got a few more monthly pledges, which I'm stoked about, but um, we also had an anonymous donor throw us um, um, an amount of money that actually made me gasp um, when he said, give me your PayPal. Uh, I want to I wanna make a donation to the podcast, and when he did, I was just shocked. Uh, he's so generous, and um, I'm just, I'm, I'm gobsmacked. I don't, I'm speechless. It was just amazing. It's going to help us so much. Um, it's going to allow me to focus on doing more interviews and it's going to allow me to get some equipment. And it was really great. If you're someone who doesn't want to get into the monthly thing with Patreon, you can always um, send us a, a PayPal donation. Um, use our email address, crash and ride at protonmail.com. That's C R A S H. A-N-D-R-I-D-E at protonmail.com. Uh, as always, that email address is absolutely confidential. It's encrypted. Nobody checks that address but me. And I will always protect your anonymity unless you expressly give me permission to uh, to talk about who you are, why you wrote. Um, also, if you want to send suggestions or complaints or suggestions for future guests or anything like that to that address please feel free to do so i'd love to hear from you um if you see me out at a gig you know come shake my hand and let's talk i'd love to hang out um speaking of that i have some gigs coming up i'm playing uh, march 29th 2019 in birmingham alabama with pinky doodle poodle the amazing japanese rock band that have uh, asked me to be their drummer it's a really great show I, I hope you'll come see them that same band is playing April 4th in Athens, Georgia at the World Famous. So come see us. Um, and I've got some great guests lined up for the next few weeks. Uh, April 1st, we're going to have a special uh, with a friend of mine, Fez Razi from Chicago, Illinois. He and I are going to do an hour on imposter syndrome and the feeling of, of just waiting to be found out, to not be qualified to do the thing you're doing or or be good enough uh and uh, it's something that he is very passionate about, and I'm really looking forward to that conversation, and I can't wait to share it with you. Uh, before we jump into the interview, I, I want to remind everybody that if you're um, contemplating uh, harming yourself, uh, or potentially taking your own life because you're just so um, overwhelmed with sadness and, and desperation, please remember you can always call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at one 800 273 8255 um, 1-800-273-8255 use that number if you need it um, and all that said uh, let's jump into our interview with Phil Smith all right we're here with Phil Smith uh, the, one of the co-hosts of the amazing Drummer's Podcast, Drummer's Weekly Groovecast, also working drummer uh, in Atlanta and the surrounding area, and holder of an MFA from University of Memphis in, you said, performance and pedagogy? Yes, I did say that. And an undergraduate in drum performance from the University of Tennessee. Correct. That's quite a resume. Well, it... it um what did Chris Farley say? Those two documents and 50 cents will get you a nice hot <laughs> cup of Jack squat. 
Well, you know, Patrick, in all honesty, man, I've never, I've done tens of thousands of gigs, you know, in my life and right. toured the world and have never had one person ask to look at those degrees. The, the only time, honestly, that they really come into my benefit is when I'm teaching college, which right. which I'm doing that now. And also, also, yeah, now you're an yeah. instructor at in Talladega? Correct, yeah, over in Alabama. That's, mm-hmm. Are you teaching um, undergrads there? Yeah, I'm teaching undergraduate. Um, basic, Basically, at, at Talladega, I teach applied percussion lessons over mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. You guys, uh, I should also mention that Phil is my drum teacher. I've been playing drums for 30 plus years. I've played over 3,000 shows. Um, and uh, a year and a half ago, I thought I, I could be better. So I started taking lessons from Phil and um, almost instantly was better. So I highly recommend that if you're a drummer looking to improve your chops, you should you should find Drummer's Weekly Groovecast and get in touch with Phil. The check's in the mail. Right. <laughs> So you said tens of thousands of gigs, but yeah. is it literally? Uh, probably, man. I, I've been doing this for 30, 33 years. Mm-hmm. Man, I, I, if you want to, let's see, let's let's start extrapolating things out. Well, maybe not tens, of, maybe close to 10,000. A yeah. couple hundred times a year. <laughs> okay. No, I, I sat down at one point and figured yeah. out five eight was doing two hundred to two hundred and twenty shows a year for about five years. So there was my thousand right there. Yeah, and that was between ninety two and ninety six, and I've played a gazillion. Shows. I'm about three thousand. Yeah, played last night. Still tired. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So how did the Drummers Weekly Groovecast come about? Well, I I love I love podcasts mm-hmm. and and I love the basic art form. Of of just pure communication because I, I think, you know, Patrick, I write also, I've had quite a few things published and, um, which also kind of leads to my love of teaching, man. Right. I, I really do like it. And at this, actually in this point in my life, uh, the articulation of concepts and ideas, I find as much joy, if not more in that as performance. So it was a few years ago that I thought, I've got a something I could say that could be of benefit mm-hmm. to some people. And I think I've got a good enough way of communicating that might have a show here, might have a podcast. So I guess it was probably in the spring of uh, 2016, I uh, called John and I said, you know, I talk me off the ledge. I, talk, I, talk me out of this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I said I, I think that I've got an idea for a show that hasn't been done, and I think it would be something that you would be great sitting across the table, and us kicking some ideas back and forth. Because you know I, I'm I'm the pseudo optimist, and he's my Eeyore. Right. You know. Well, you guys are definitely like yin and yang. Yeah, and and that's there's no 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 small coincidence that that leads to the success of the show the show I think right um but i basically said look i think what we could do is we could sit down and instead of doing a purely interview based show right which is what virtually all of the drumming podcasts are right i said we could do a straight up concept based show that would be the de facto sitting at the drum shop drum hang so to speak you know, which just a bunch of guys, man, sitting around talking shop because that's where we have a lot of our, our best conversations. And right. We learn a lot whenever we do this, right? Right. And so that ended up being oh my god, the, hold on. the basic concept. Hey, you don't you don't have to do that. You, my dog is as clearly to anyone who's listening. My my dog has realized there's a stranger in the house. It's Michael Vick. That's not Michael. <laughs> Come, Come here, here buddy. Come here. <laughs> I think we're gonna just leave this in. Um. Oh, hi. You really are concerned. The dog has gotten in my lap. Um, so I find that one of my great favorite things about the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast is that John sort of represents in many ways the purely intuitive um, kind of um, emotion-driven drummer who has not, you know, he's got chops. He's got way more chops than he thinks he does, but he's not someone who parses out every 16th note uh, and writes a chart and you're definitely with your MFA and just your vast amount of experience. You're more of the sort of, uh, I don't want to say academic. It sounds like I'm being dismissive, but definitely more learned and technical thinker about drums. 
Well, I think John's got you snowed. He's got a lot of people snowed because oh, he's yeah. he's one of the most intelligent drummers, man, that that I've ever oh, met. Oh, I don't I don't want to imply that yeah. he's not super smart. Well, right, yeah. right. But what I'm saying is also he gets that whole thing of like, oh man, I don't even know how I got to the gig. It's lucky I'm just here, you know that sort of thing. <laughs> no, I and get it. He, yeah. He's the silent assassin. Yeah, John, I, I, you know, I see him play. He's got such a great pocket and a great feel. Um, and I know that he went to school. Did he drop out? Yeah, he did. He just went for a few semesters. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of, I never actually studied music in school. Um, I studied political science, but that's a whole other, that's another world. That's worlds away. <laughs> yeah. So um, tell me a little bit about your early life. Like, where did you grow up? Ooh, I'm a hillbilly. Really? Me too. Oh, yeah, yeah, man. I, I'm, I'm of Scots Irish descent from Appalachia. What part? Uh, the foothills of East Tennessee, just outside of Knoxville. A little, little small town called Athens, Tennessee. The other Athens. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I'm actually from a place called Eden, North Carolina. These dogs are chaos today. This is hilarious. Um, I'm from a place called Eden, North Carolina, which is um, in the Piedmont, just southeast of the hills. So mm -hmm. um, I kind of I get that. Um, and... Uh, how did you stumble into you know, drumming in Athens, Tennessee? A complete and total dumbed into it, man. Yeah. I mean, completely and totally dumbed into it. Essentially, the to make a long story stupid, as my buddy Chris Brady would say, <laughs> um, when I was in seventh grade in um, just middle school and junior high is what they called it, uh, Essentially, I had some some friends that wanted to put some kind of a band together, and me being someone of esoteric tastes, especially es esoteric tastes for uh, Appalachia. <laughs> right. <laughs> the, these guys were basically saying, "Well, look, I I've got a guitar and I've got a bass," and I said, "You know what? I've always wanted to play drums. I'm going to get drums." I ended up getting drums on a whim, and I suppose had some modicum of natural talent and probably more motivation than a lot of people in that area to want to do something that's right. outside of the norm. And I taught myself for a while, and that's how it got started. What was your first kit? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that because I was thinking about that on the way over. Check this out, Patrick. Do you remember there was a beginner line that Pearl made called Power Sonic? I honestly don't. Yeah, it was a. Like, That's kind of amazing. Yeah, I'm sure it was some Chinese or Taiwanese made um, Pearl Power Sonic kit. Right. Wow. Mm -hmm. And what was your home life like? Well, uh, home life was probably fairly typical uh -huh. of that region of the country, right? Where I had a very a blue collar. Uh, upbringing my mom worked for the uh, phone company back when it was South Central Bell that was before the the breakup of the monopoly so to speak of all that thing all right. that my dad was a um, worker for the Gulf Oil, Oil Corporation now not like a roughneck or anything like that but he worked for a distributorship was right. what it was while he was there and he did some bookkeeping and I suppose just some things around that plant uh, but, uh, you know, very blue collar, lower middle class type of upbringing. But I think the formative aspect that you need to be aware of. And one of the things that, that really has made me what I am was my father ended up, um, having contracting cancer, um, in my, I guess, probably, early elementary school years probably when i was seven or eight years old he passed away when i just turned 12 oh man yeah lymphoma yeah uh, it was a combination of things patrick it was uh thyroid uh lung and i believe some stomach cancer as well That's, i mean i would guessing the business he was in that sounds like benzene or xylene it also sounds like many packs of cigarettes a day. And cigarettes will also do it. Yeah. Plus, also, he was military, man. He was one of those uh, kids that, at the age of 16, uh, went into the military for World War II. He was in France right after all the heavy stuff happened. 
and then he was in uh, Korea while the heavy stuff was happening. Yeah, did he have some PTSD? I'm sure he did, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My uh, grandfather was a World War II vet, mm-hmm. um, and my dad's Vietnam vet. So. Yeah. Man, so you lost him when you were 12. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. sounds really tough. Well, when you are going through it at the time, I think you just take it for what it is because you don't know anything else, right? Right. Uh, and then when you look back on it, you can certainly see where some of your formative years and where some of your personalities and some and some of the different things that make you what you are stemmed from. Mm-hmm. Sounds to me like the, your drumming was sort of concurrent with his decline and eventual death. It came right after. Right. Right after. Because honestly, let me tell you, I don't know if I would have gone that route if he was alive. Uh-huh. I, that's... Sometimes I have a hard time explaining to younger people how difficult it was to announce to your family that you were going to play in a rock band. Mm-hmm. Because now it's fairly accepted. But when I was a kid, um, you know, uh, our parents' generation had watched Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, and, and untold other people die of uh, rock and roll related excess. And there was this assumption if you started playing in a rock band, you were going to be a Satan worshiping heroin addict. Mm-hmm. And it was pretty, I had to hide my drum set for a couple of years, um, you know, at other people's houses. And so I think with the loss of your father, I guess that sort of cleared up any objections on his part. To, well, it, it certainly did. Maybe not to the objections of my neighbors and, right. and, and, you know, lots of other people. My mom was supportive from the standpoint that ignorance is bliss mm-hmm. and, and essentially I think all that really boiled down to was she never honestly, even to the day that she died, had a concept of what I did. Uh, it was the type of thing. I mean, she knew that I played drums, but but Patrick, I mean, I'm being 100 percent serious when I tell you this. I could tell my mom that I was going out and that I was playing a bar gig and I was making fifty dollars or five thousand dollars. And she would just go, OK, <laughs> I get it. Right. <laughs> right. And, and it's the same thing. I mean, like if I was on, if I was doing something where I was on TV or if I was on the road, I could, I could have literally said the same thing. I could have go, you know, I'm going out on the road with this person and I'm going to make $50 a night or I'm going to make 2000 or $3,000 a week and should have been, oh, that's nice. I don't know that she ever really had a concept of what it really was that I did for a living. And I tried to explain it to her, yeah. <laughs> you know, but again, like I said, that, that's just kind of the way Do you, si- you have siblings? I do. I have a old, significantly older brother. A brother that's 13 years older than me. Oh. Yeah. Huh. It just sounds like your mom was a little unplugged. Well, it, 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 it could be that. It could be just, again, the whole thing that, that ignorance is bliss. I mean, she was a small town lady, right. right, that she absolutely wanted the best for me. And I think that she knew that I was very happy with what that I was doing. And she could obviously tell that I was making a good enough living because I never asked her for money. I never needed money. And and she saw the way that I lived. And I think she realized also that there was some modicum of legitimacy to it. You know, when I went through school as well. Right. So, you know, and and I I suppose that one of the first times that it maybe really rang home that, you know, this kid is probably going to be okay. Is that uh, when I graduated from, from UT, um, uh, that in itself had a good bit of currency to it. But when she then found out that when I went to graduate school, I was actually, um, you know, offered a graduate assistantship and was paid on top of it. So I actually went to school for free and then was paid on top of that. I mean, it's sort of like she then got it that, okay, maybe he knows what he's doing now. Right. So grad school, yeah. just listening to the groove cast, I remember a couple of times you were pretty much playing straight ahead then, right? Mostly like sort of bop style or virtually all. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, well that, yeah. and, and let me say this con- concert style percussion also. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. the white glove gigs, <laughs> man, t- tuning a timpani, uh, while the rest of the symphony is rocketing along at, a you know, 110 beats per minute is, a uh, insane. I it, don't know how you guys do it. it well, I don't. 
Patrick. I mean, yeah. let, let me. I leave that to the professionals. Right. <laughs> let me tell you, you you will never find a more qualified musician on the face of the planet than a a, a true symphonic tim, timpanist. Right. I mean, you know, go look at a Stravinsky or a Bartok score and right. try to tune five drums chromatically during. <laughs> Odd time signatures while <laughs> while the symphony's going sharp. Right. No, I mean back there with a pitch pipe, like you know, doom, doom, try not to make too loud a noise while you get that pedal. Yeah, exactly those the, man. Let me tell you, Patrick. Those guys don't use pitch pipe. They got his. They got the the ear of a concert master violinist, my friend. Man, I can't even imagine. Yeah, that's nuts. Uh-huh. So when did you? My sort of guess based on what we talked about a little bit uh, heading into this interview is that you've you've struggled with anxiety off and on. <laughs> <laughs> tell me all about it man when did when did you first sort of start like were you an anxious kid oh yeah yeah it what i it it's had to come from dealing with a sick father so your dad first starts to show symptoms at when you're eight years old seven or eight yeah okay. something and, like that and his symptoms were Oh my God, it's horrific, man! And, and and you have to keep in mind also that we're talking about the mid to late seventies here, mm-hmm. okay? And the way, and I don't want to marginalize people who are dealing with cancer right now. It's still absolutely horrific. But go back almost fifty years, you know, forty five years ago from when we're recording this right now, and look at how they treated cancer back then. It was basically barbarism <laughs> compared sure. to even what they do now. Right. And so and what they do now is hard on the body. It's terrible, right? Yeah. But it's so much more refined than it was back then. Right. Right. But the effects of seeing him go through chemotherapy, even as a kid, you know, you know, I still remember it. It, it, it the sickness and just the absolute torture on this guy uh, and, you know, after doing a lot of, uh, you know, psychotherapy and also doing a lot of just personal therapy, a lot of journaling, I'm a huge, huge believer in journaling, journaling and, I, and I think I've got a lot of things I can offer people to, to help with, yeah. with combating generalized anxiety is essentially one of the things that used to bring him joy was when I used to excel at things. And I've always been a good student. I was always good when I was a kid, especially in sports at like baseball. I was very good at that. And what, what's, uh, what's your baseball position? I did two things, man. I was pitching in first base. I, I pitched a little in yeah. high school, but Frank Thomas was on my ba- high school baseball yeah, a team. little slouch. So he kind of ruined me like – Forever thinking I had any illusions about being a pitcher, so sure or a hitter. <laughs> <laughs> that guy can rake. Yeah, no, he used to take everybody's best pitch and put it in Miss Henry's computer classroom, which was over the left field fence on the third floor. And yeah, just crush it. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I, I put a lot of self-imposed pressure on myself to excel. Yeah. You know, and and the psychotherapist will tell you if you're familiar, Patrick, with the term magical thinking. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and that's what that was, man. You know, you think you're gonna help make this person better by you know excelling in classwork and excelling, you know, in baseball and doing real well, and so quite a bit of self motivation in that way, and that leads to issues, you know, yeah. and you know, especially as a kid, also. I don't know if it's, again, one of those things where ignorance is bliss or if they legitimately don't notice. But parents, I don't think, or I maybe even to this day, but still back then, didn't necessarily look at anxiety or look at this type of thing that was going on as necessarily a bad thing or even a problem at all. Right. It's not really as strong. The baby boomer, I guess that you're... Your dad was pre-baby boomer. That generation didn't even believe in psychotherapy. Like, yeah, in 1925 is when he was born. Yeah, man. That's only a few years younger than my grandpa. Mm-hmm. So, so to sort of follow this thread of trying to excel at baseball and academics and mm-hmm. and um, everything else of being a kid um, in the sort of subconscious hope that it might somehow improve your dad's condition, even though he was clearly declining. Um, when you fail at that, that must have been pretty tough. 
if it's if it's not even the failing aspect, it's the fear of failing aspect mm -hmm. is what it is. And that I think is the, the general crux of anxiety is the fear of future events going badly. Yeah. Yeah. It's no fun. Yeah. So you just push her back. Yeah. Yeah. It's my um, buddy, my comfort. This is this is my therapy, dog. <laughs> this is Parker. You, you leave her alone. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So um, that that carried all the way through um, your early life. Yeah, your, your dad passed when you were in what we called middle school. Now we call junior high. Then he he yeah he passed when I was in the sixth grade. Correct. Man. Mm -hmm. Did your mom remarry? No. Mm -mm. Not a huge pool of gentlemen in that area. In Athens, Tennessee. Yeah. And your brother was out of the house by then already. Yeah. Mm hmm Yep, he sure was because uh, he would have been uh, 25. Yeah. So you start your first band. Mm -hmm. um, you pour everything you have into being the best drummer that you can because you've historically been an overachiever mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. And um, you get into UT. Mm-hmm. Um, which is right there in Knoxville. So yeah. It's close to Athens. 60 miles. Wow. Mm -hmm. And you start your career as a professional musician. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, one of my favorite stories from the early days of Drummer's Weekly Groovecast was sleeping through a gig. Yeah. Was that at Memphis or was that at UT? That was at UT. That was my senior year. Tell me more about that. Cause... <laughs> uh, well, that, that was one of those things that... Uh, you know, you've ever heard, I'm sure you've heard the, the old musician saying is some people don't learn until you lose the gig, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, I've lived it. Right, yeah. yeah. And um, that was one of those uh, times where it was a gig that was just, it was mentioned to me sort of off the cuff, and it was something that I agreed to. I didn't either write it in my book or, of course, didn't remember it. And I, it, it, was, a, it was a morning gig. It was a, a parade was what it was. I can't remember which, what parade it was, but it was going to be televised. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And, so brutal. Oh, it gets even better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but essentially what it was, it was I was supposed to be performing on a float, going down the middle of the street, and it was going to be on TV for whatever celebration it was, right? And essentially, I had had a gig the night before, right. and you know, typically late. Probably didn't finish till midnight or one o'clock, maybe even later. Mm -hmm. You know, you roll in, and then I was supposed to get a couple of few hours of tortured sleep, then roll down to this parade route at probably like seven a.m. or something like that, and right. load up, and then take off and go. And essentially, what it was was I had turned off my phone, turned down my answering machine, because remember, this is right. early nineties right, answering right. machine. Right. And so uh, essentially what ended up happening was uh, I woke up in time to see about seven messages on my answering machine and then turn on the TV to see the parade float going by that I was supposed to be on. <laughs> so as a guy who's already got anxiety, I'm sure that was a great moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Patrick, here's a, here's a really interesting feature to my anxiety. Yeah. I had a damn near complete remission of it from the time I was a freshman through when I got out of graduate school. So there was a nearly six year period of time. Now that of course brought on a little bit, right? But yeah, I was nearly completely and totally free of anxiety at that time. Do you attribute that to anything? Absolutely. Which what? I, I let me tell you. I have got what I would consider a complete set of ideas and concepts for not only what triggers my anxiety, but what fixes it, or at least mitigates it completely. Because I I am a firm believer from the standpoint that someone who has as much chronic generalized anxiety as I do uh -huh. you never get rid of it it's always sitting there ready to come out but you have to learn how to manage it and, and mitigate it now, now let's I want to get to that but I also want to ask yeah. like 
when you were younger, did you have anxiety attacks or just like a sort of constant sort of distraction from your ability to be comfortable or happy? It, it was it was primarily the generalized underlying consistency of it yeah. that would that would be exacerbated by the panic style attack. Although let me tell you that the the most the biggest aspects and the, the 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 worst parts of my anxiety came significantly later, and I can explain that too. Okay. And and it all has to do with the the, the concept the concepts and the conceptualization of of why my anxiety existed, what exacerbates it, and how I have managed it. Honestly, just really formulated about six to eight years ago. Okay. So what was it about college that your six years of undergrad and graduate school that seems to have now keep in mind I did not realize that during the time of college right you what consciously right what right. what was the primary mitigator of that entire thing I now know what it is and let me say this there's the big concept or the big cure Okay, right. and then there's several small things underneath it that are a part of it. Okay, the cure. Everybody sitting on their hands, or you know, just with bated breath on this. Right, and and I will explain this in detail. The cure, for me, and I think for a lot of other people, because I've I've expressed this, and I even teach this to my students that deal with this. It's the voluntary assumption of personal responsibility okay 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 I cannot exclaim to the rooftops loud enough the key importance of that okay and I can completely unpack that for you as much as possible let's do that son. okay because I'm sort of letting that sink in and, and yeah let's let's yeah. Let's give some examples and stuff. Okay. All right. First off, we'll talk about how I didn't have any issues when I was in college. Okay? Right. Or very, very little. Okay. Very little compared to what I had d dealt with in the years prior to that. When I went to college, I no longer had mom around. Right. I no longer had any and didn't have anybody to do anything for me. If I wanted it done, I had to do it. Right. And I also had to take responsibility for the career path, and I had to take responsibility for doing what I needed to have done, done. Right. And quite honestly, Patrick, prior to that, I was a bit of a rudderless ship when I was in small town East Tennessee. In high school where I excelled in it, I did well in it, but I was not passionate about it. I, I, I did what I needed to do to get through, mm -hmm. but I didn't have a real purpose in life, and I really didn't take any responsibility for, man, I weighed about 60 pounds more than I, did, than I do right now. Yeah, I was just, I, overall, just a, 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 quite honestly, a mess physically. Right. And and this I was in high school in the wake of your father's passing. Yeah, uh -huh. probably stress eating. Something. Oh, absolutely! I'm sure I was. Yeah, I'm sure I was. But I didn't really take the yoke of responsibility, so to speak, to say, you know, I, I've got to I got to pull myself up by the bootstraps. Didn't know any better. Right. 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 You know, and then it just sort of happened. Of course, when I was in undergraduate school. And I had, man, I had a mission. I had something that I had to do. And I had to have, there was something that I had to take responsibility for. In turn, I had to take responsibility for myself, responsibility for my career path. I had to take responsibility in so many ways, man, uh, to, to not waste the money that my mother was helping me with to go to school. Right. And when you have that sort of, when you have a goal, so to speak, and you have this responsibility, for lack of a better term, what it does is that in itself 
it helps you mitigate the suffering, if you want to go in a Buddhist perspective of sure, this, sure. of everyday life for that. that. That dovetails with something that I think about every day. And I, and I, 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 don't, want to, I don't want to derail this discussion too much, but I, I think this might reinforce your point, which is that I'm a big believer that you should make wishes. Mm-hmm. That sounds absolutely absurd, but like if you look over and the clock says 11, 11, and you see a shooting star, in that instant, force yourself to, or don't force yourself, but make a wish because it'll help you sort of, I'm trying to think of a better word, but to, to create an idea of what it is that you actually desire. You know, yeah. If somebody says, what is it that you want? We color our answers based on what we perceive the person who's asking's preferences to be. Like, you know, we, we, we sort of manage our own expectations based on what we deem appropriate. Mm-hmm. But like that impulse of like eleven eleven, I want blah. You know, you really you're being honest with yourself at that time. And when you make wishes, it makes it easier for you to conceptualize goals. And when you conceptualize goals, you have markers along the way that you can ask yourself. Like when you're in college at UT in Knoxville, mm-hmm. and you say, "What is it that I want to do today?" Well, I don't want to do anything that's going to cause me to waste my mom's money and flunk out of school. So you know, am I going to to go to class yes am i going to after class go to ray's house and drink everclear and (laughs) kool-aid probably not but if you rattle a ship there's no guidepost that's exactly right man that is exactly right and the the, you know i I mentioned that there were several other kind of subheadings underneath that that massive heading of the taking response of personal responsibility for your life, right? right? That, that sort of thing. And what you just made an absolutely brilliant salient point here when you were talking about, look, I've got to have this goal to do this. And I know this is what I need to do. It's for the long term. It's for the better aspect. And I do have the choice of like you said, going over to Ray's house and drinking Everclear. And right. that, that short-term choice right there sure does, sure does look really good at the moment, right? Right. If you can get past that short-term gratification and look to the long-term, you're going to be – anybody's hard convinced to tell me that short-term solutions are better than long-term. 99% of the time, the long-term solutions are the way you want to go. Right. In this situation. And that's something that I learned during that time as well. And like I said, a lot of this stuff really didn't get conceptualized and really didn't get parsed out until about seven or eight years ago. Yeah. Well, I would I would find it sort of puzzling if you had worked all this out as an undergrad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some people do, I think. I I think some people, if they don't consciously do it, they subconsciously do it. And then all of a sudden, you know, that's why you have some of... You know, there are naturally people that are massively successful. I mean, you'd have to think that somebody like Elon Musk probably has, you know, just knows that innately. Well, I think there's a certain pathology for some people that success is uh, um, internal. Like external success, they measure their internal self-worth through it. And I think that like that's a guy who's driven by this this conceptualization of himself as being successful. What happens then, though, is if you make a bad business decision and everything falls apart, you right, yeah, you, you become uh, you, you you lose your sense of self, and I, I definitely don't ever want to be that guy. I, you know, the, remember you hear the stories of the stock market crash in nineteen twenty nine, people jumping out of windows. I don't ever want to be the guy who's like, I don't have any more money, therefore my life loses value because I've been yeah. bro- I've been broke a lot. I mean, yeah. I'm a professional musician. It's not it's hard to to like have a lot of money it's know? true mm-hmm. well, i guess as i sort of think about how this is going to be heard by people who are listening you know some of the people that i'm doing this podcast for i think are their goal today is to not kill themselves yeah you know mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and uh so you know i think that in some cases it's it might be difficult to sort of realize some of the higher actualizations of of, of aspiration if your goal today is to just not be room temperature. Sure. I mean, have you ever sort of been at a low point like that? And how did you claw your way out of oh, it? Oh, brother, I've been in some low points. Ne- never to the point, though, of, of doing self-harm. Right. Okay. But I've, man, I, I have gotten to the point to where I thought I was dying through a panic attack. Yeah, man, I've, I've been there. 
you know, and there is nothing more alarming than, uh, you know, being literally frozen in your steps, thinking you're having a heart attack, dying with the room spinning around you. Been mm-hmm. there. Yeah. That's not a lot of fun. Um, when, when did the, did you have those first uh, panic attacks as a, a young person before college or? No, no. The, those really bad ones, man, were the summer of 2000. What was happening then? Oh my God, man. It, I, again, I had fallen trap of being the rudderless ship right? from a standpoint, man, of possibly not, not realizing what I needed to do professionally and personally. I, I had lost that yoke of responsibility. When did you get at that your, time? When did you get your master's? Ninety two. Oh, so this was years after college. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Did you fall into a band situation or something through the nineties? No, I, I fell into a complacency situation. Okay. And essentially what it was was uh after I had completed that master's degree, I had gotten to a point, man, to where I was comfortably making a living from a standpoint of doing gigs and, and was doing some teaching. But I think essentially I realized uh, if definitely consciously at that point, but probably subconsciously before that building up to that nice crescendo of panic yeah. that, that, that I needed to be doing, no, I needed to be doing more. I needed, I needed to fulfill my potential more than it was. And I was not doing that, man. Yeah. I was not fulfilling my p- potential in many different ways. I was not f- fulfilling my potential potential on that so after grad and, school and you, you honest s- honest you, let me say this i was yeah. an ungrateful bastard at that time as well interesting and, and that's another thing man let me tell you for for anybody who is who is feeling bad right uh-huh. now to the point of of suicide see if you can find just one thing today to be grateful for that yeah. is something patrick i think is vastly missing man in in our world today yeah vastly there's a let me say this don't get it twisted. There are great injustices out there. Right. But I think if you can find one thing to be grateful for, yeah. do it. Uh, yeah. I mean, gratitude is a big part of the, the, the program, the secret society I'm a member of that keeps me from using drugs mm-hmm. um, and remembering to, to, to be grateful that you have anything uh, is important. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds to me like you came out of grad school and you set what you now consider to be a fairly low bar of achievement for yourself and you fell into a routine. Like yeah. you were, I've just got to make enough yeah. money to, to, I've got a gig enough to pay my rent and bills uh-huh. and, and maintain my equipment. And, but you feel like it was some sort of a spiritually hollow set of aspirations. Totally hollow. Pat- Patrick, I can tell you, man, listen, this is, let me give you my description of hell on earth. Uh, back in the late uh, 1990s and early 2000s, um, I sort of became what I am considering now the de facto man of leisure okay. to where uh, I thought it was a great idea and that I deserved uh, to just do whatever I wanted to at any time and do the, do my gigs, make my money, you know, that I needed to, to get where I needed to be, do my teaching that I needed to do. And I, um, I ended up getting one of the first subscriptions to Netflix back when it was just send your discs. Yeah. Send your discs. And I had like the top thing where you could get like five discs at a time, man. And dude, I was watching all these fantastic foreign movies and art films and things that you could never see, right? Right. You know, unless you had some kind of a subscription to this, just impossibly difficult to find and view movies. I can't tell you how many hundreds of those that I watched during the day, and now that I look back on it, how hollow and miserable I was. Now, that's not to take away from the movies. The movies were fantastic. Yeah. But, man, I was not fulfilling what I needed to be as a human being, as a, as a drummer, as a husband, mm-hmm. you know, and it so was, you're, you're married during this time. Yes. Uh-huh. uh-huh. And it was just, it was miserable. You know, I was miserable at that time and I didn't realize it. You know, you sit here and you think, well, you know, I, I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And I'm going to lead this not hedonistic lifestyle, 
but this lifestyle of leisure. That's what it's all about, right? Right. It's all about doing that thing. Man, that's when my anxiety came back with an absolute vengeance, the worst that it's ever been. And it came to just a unbelievable crescendo, man, in the late 2000s, 2009, 2010. Awful. Yeah. In in new and creative ways. <laughs> yeah. Um I I you know, I had a I had a day job up until last November and got laid off unexpectedly and that was sort of the impetus to starting the podcast. Mm-hmm. But there was a day it was like you know, my first reaction was to panic. Um and then I figured out that I had a lot of gigs scheduled already and some of which are pretty good paying gigs and, and I could throw my shoulder against that wheel and get more gigs and then they came. But like there was a day in the first couple of weeks where it was like a Tuesday morning at ten o'clock in the morning and I was standing in the kitchen and I didn't know where the fuck I was supposed to be. Yeah. And that I started to spin up into an anxiety attack and I talked myself down, but I was like so used to having a place to be. You know, whether I wanted to be there or not, most of the time not. I kind of hated my job. Mm-hmm. But there was a moment where I was just like starting to think, oh, oh man, I'm I'm a superfluous human being. And that's a bad feeling for me, mm-hmm. you know. And that with that sort of unstructure and freedom comes, for me, a sense of, of, of loss, a sense of, 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 um, of directionlessness. And it sounds like that's sort of what we're talking about. But like it it manifested itself in a really bad way for you. It absolutely did. And I I think that when I look back at that, that period of time, and we'll just take that, that example of the Netflix thing, you know, and, you know, and wasting, in my opinion, all these days, you know, at this time when I could have been doing significantly more productive things that again, that was a short term gratification. It's like, Oh, this is going to be great, man. I'm going to be able to sit here and watch it. Everybody wants to do this. You know, this right. is, and, and, and it's the type of thing, man, that it's just, it's a very thinly veiled happiness that, that has no substance to it, man. It really has no meat to it whatsoever. Right. And, and I am absolutely at my happy, happiest, most fulfilled when I am doing the things that I know that I need to be doing. And, and part of that also has to be, you also have to be very honest with yourself as well. You have uh-huh. to be super honest with yourself. And that is very difficult for people to be. And I am happiest when I am being a good family man. Right. When I am practicing, working on my craft, being productive, doing things that I know that I need to do because there are things that I need to say and things. And, and I, and again, I love teaching, love, love, love teaching. I had great teachers when I was in school and that became mentors of mine. And if I can give any of that back, it makes me so happy. Right. That's, that's, that's my mission in life now, man. It really right. is. So how did you climb out of this? Like, you, you, was there a, mm-hmm. a moment of oh, clarity? Yeah. Oh, yes. Talk to me about that. Yes. And, and let me back up just a second and get to the point of where I had to get something done and I had to get something done permanently. I had to have a long-term real solution. Right. Right. Because I thought I was losing my mind. Not a great feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Patrick, when I first started having uh, generalized anxiety issues as a kid, it was all stomach related, nauseous sort of type type uh, anxiety. Uh After it abated during school and when I got out that it returned similar kind. Uh But it decided to take a new form as I got a little bit older and the new form turned into uh, panic style shortness of breath yeah the the just absolute spinning head sort of thing yes I'm Uh, familiar oh yeah (laughs) heart connoisseur yeah like like heart attack style symptoms right and just unbelievable fatigue man oh my god just bone tired fatigue it it would hit me right Mm -hmm. and um it then even took another twist in the late 
2000s, like 2008, 2009, to where I started having physical pain. Where? Uh, shoulder, elbow, arm. While you're playing? Neck. No. That, that's the only, Because I was doing what I was supposed to be doing at that right. time. Never at that time. So this idle, idle time is when you really yes, suffer. Yes, absolutely. How long did you mm-hmm. suffer with this? Well, with the physical musculoskeletal pain, several years. And that's where this roundabout cure happened. Okay. Okay. Let me just, I wasn't even going to bring this up, Uh but I feel like it's pertinent now. Yeah. I mentioned to someone that, uh, number one, I loved your podcast. Number two, that we were going to do an interview. And Mm -hmm. the guy said, I know that guy. I don't like that guy. (laughs) And I was like, who doesn't like Phil? Have you heard his podcast? I don't, I don't. I really don't have any interest in his podcast. And I was like, when did you meet him? And he said, I don't know, 2008. Yeah. And I said, what was your, what was your, what was it like? I mean, I just, he's like the most open and giving human being I think I've ever met. And they said, well, he wasn't then. That's exactly right. And they were another guy like me, sort of rock, indie rock drummer. Mm -hmm. And they met you and, their description was he's a jazz snob. And yes, he, and I apologize to that person profusely right now. I, I'm I, I the reason I wasn't going to bring it up is I thought people change, but it sounds to me like you were in this sort of narcissism of idleness period yes. in your life, mm-hmm. and that's not a great place for people, <laughs> social persons. Like, yeah. and that that's probably when you met this guy and. You guys had what sounds to me like what I always consider to be the classic music store exchange, where you walk into the music store and the guy mm-hmm. just rains on you as if from this position of perceived status. And like you know, when you're a young kid, you're like, this 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 hurts, you know? Yeah. Uh, and listen, if you're if you're listening to this right now, reach out to me. Come 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 my way, man. Well, I'll come out and buy oh, you man. lunch. I'm gonna uh, as mm-hmm. soon as we get off the. As soon as the mics are off and you're headed to your gig, I'm I'm calling this dude being like, I yeah. think we've cracked the code here. You have. <laughs> so you, you're hitting this this depth of physical oh, yeah. pain, mm-hmm. anxiety symptoms. It's 2009. And mm-hmm. some part of you must be like, I have to find a solution to this. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it, it comes in several stages with the massive realization coming in about 2011, okay? And so essentially what it was, was naturally when you get to the point of having significant physical pain, right? Right. You got to find a solution because when you have physical musculoskeletal pain, your brain goes all the way back millions of years. And it's basically saying you do nothing until you get this fixed. Right. Right. So I ended up going to the doctor and, you know, you go through the battery of x-rays and everything, you know, and the doctor comes back and, you know, they're so nice. And they're like, hey, the good news is <laughs> there's nothing wrong. You know, it's it's all it's all muscular kind of thing. Right? And what you're hoping for is a magic bullet. Yes. Like, I'm right. going to I'm going to write you a prescription for um, mm-hmm. Dr. Bob's magic pill yep. that makes all this shit go away. Yep. Yep. And instead you get. You've got to fix your brain. Mm-hmm. Well, no, it didn't even wasn't even that. Yeah. That's what that's ultimately what it was, right? right okay, right. but that's the, it, what it. Prior to that, though, <laughs> it was it was you know the Western thing that no matter what's wrong with you, there has to be an outside physical source. So that's that's there's got to be an injury or something, right? right? The doctor's okay. like, you don't yeah. have cancer, and you're like, oh shit, something else is wrong. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> that's terrible news. So you start going through the battery of prescribed fixes right which is like look you know why don't you take some ibuprofen you know that sort of thing if that doesn't work we'll do physical therapy so you go through physical therapy you get minor results right and then you know you just get rid of that and then the physical therapist goes you know what why don't you go see this guy who's who's well renowned is one of the top musculoskeletal massage therapist, neuromuscular massage is what it's called. Mm -hmm. (coughs) Go see this guy. And she warned me, she goes, he's going to beat you up, man, but he's he's good, right? At least some part of your brain is like, thank God. Right, yeah. Yeah. And you know, and you get in there and the massage therapist, he was like, man, your muscles are like freaking rocks in your neck and shoulders. Right. You know, down your arm. By this time, I was starting to have basal joint thumb issues. Again, never when I'm playing. Keep that in mind. Right. Right. And uh, this guy was beating me up and, and sure enough, I was getting 
I was getting results from that, right? Right. But they would always be temporary. Right, and then the symptoms would return. Symptoms would return back, right? So I had gone to see this guy maybe seven, eight times, and I think he knew. I think he knew what was going on. I think he knew that you know that there was something something else that he wasn't going to be able to completely and totally fix. So he goes, "Listen, I'm going to give you the name and number of a chiropractor that I want you to go see." Right? So he gives me this piece of paper, and it says. Dr. Garusahai Khalsa. Okay, now if you're familiar with that last name, that last name is a... Khalsa. Yeah, it's a Sikh yeah. name, right? I've got some really good friends in yeah. India who are Sikh. Mm-hmm. This doctor's a really good friend of mine. Now. Yeah. Okay. So I call this gentleman up, and he's a straight-up Sikh Dharma minister, but he's also a straight-up doctor as well, Right. right? He practices acupuncture. He also practices chiropractic. He is a kundalini yoga master mm-hmm. as well. Okay? So I go to see this guy. I spend an hour and a half in my first my first session with him, right? Yeah. And he does a lot of what I would call like airy-fairy kind of things, right? Because, right. you know, here I am, Western male, right. you know, this type thing. Is there a pill here I can take? Right, right. exactly. You know, So he goes through this entire thing. And he goes, well, look, man, he goes, um, I'm going to give you a couple of things that I want you to do a little homework, not realizing that what he was doing at that time. Right. 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 You know, he's working on between my ears, not my shoulder. Right. Right. What are, the, right. what are the airy fairy things? Though? Oh, he was doing all this applied reflexology kind of stuff, you know. I don't, you'll have to define that. For he, me. Yeah, like he was doing things. He would go, "Tell me where you've had different injuries before," you know. And I'd say, "Well, I had some surgery on my knee, and then you know, I had an injury at the ankle, and I had a, you know, an injury on top of my head one time." You know, and he'd go through and he'd do all this stuff. You know, I can't even remember what like reflexology and you know that type thing. And then he, of course, he did some straight up like chiropractic adjustments as well. And right. and I want to. Touch on that in a minute, okay? Right. But he gives you homework. He gives me homework, right? And so I come back like a week later. He does, again, some of the similar things again, you know, Mm -hmm. and asks me how the homework was. And, you know, and I'm like, okay, that's fine, you know. And he goes, okay, I want to see you back here in another week. So come back in another week. And, man, he's doing, again, all these different types of adjust. He was adjusting literally my thumb. and, and, And I was getting better, right? I was getting better as we go along. So this went on for a period of about four to six weeks where I'd seen him maybe like half a dozen times. And, and he asked me at the end of that sixth time, he goes, how are you feeling? I said, man, I am feeling significantly better. I didn't really have any symptoms at all until like last week. And he goes, okay, here's your final assignment. He goes, I want you to get this book and I'm going to, I'm going to tell you the book here in a second. Okay. He goes, I want you to get this book and I want you to read it cover to cover. And he goes, you're going to find yourself on every page of this book. And he goes, when you start feeling symptoms again, he goes, I want you to call Mukta. That's his wife, who right. was the, the wonderful lady, who was his receptionist. And he goes, I want you to call Mukta. I want you to tell her you want to make an appointment. And she's going to tell you that you're fine. <laughs> man, I, I'm, 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 I'm getting emotional about it, man, because let me tell you, this guy, he changed my life, man. Yeah, yeah. And so... Anyway, I went and got this book, okay. okay? And this book is from a guy, maybe this will ring true in the minds, and, and people will find this name familiar whenever I say this, but it was a guy named Dr. John Sarno. He's a doctor at Columbia University. He just passed away yeah. last year at like the age of 94, something like that. He practiced up nearly to the day he died. And he was one of the, oh, he's not the founder, but he was one of the, Western doctors in the mid 70s that essentially brought back what we call mind body practice. Right. And essentially, what it is is this, and this is a very crude description of it. Okay. But essentially, what it is is that your mind can give you symptoms, real, honestly serious physical anxiety, physical pain symptoms that absolutely are real. They're not in your mind. Right. They're generated in your mind through temporary oxygen restriction to Mm -hmm. the muscles. Right. 
and it causes physical pain. This the Sarno's. Does he have a book that's uh, about specifically about back pain? Yes, that book has been recommended to me several times. Yes, yeah. And let me say this: before anybody who's listening to this goes, "Well, I don't have back pain," substitute any symptom you are having for that term back pain and get that book and read it cover to cover. That's read the it book multiple we're times. Yes, yeah, called Healing Back Pain by that's Dr. It. John Sarno. It has been recommended to me several times. That book. I should have read it. I'm is guessing. It's unbelievable. I was in tears. You were going to see yourself on every page. It, his, it's his unbelievable prediction. when you read that book and you see what's in that book. Because it, for, for people who go, well, you know, my anxiety is, is real. It's from external sources and my pain is real. I, I, I really, d- d- yes, your pain is real and your anxiety absolutely 100% is real. But it's generated from your brain. And, and one of the greatest descriptions, you don't need a leap of faith to believe this. What you need is you need understanding and you need education. Right. Okay. And one of the clearest and one of the best ways that you can get somebody involved in this, and this is completely and totally accepted. How many times have you heard somebody go, like, let's say they're they're getting ready to do a potentially stress invoking sort of thing. Let's say like one of the big things is is public speaking in front of people. Right. Okay. Okay? And people always go, I always get butterflies in my stomach before that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very widely accepted that that's just a mental thing, you know, right. that that's causing these butterflies in your stomach. There are well, no actual insects in your exactly, stomach. Exactly, right? <laughs> right? So the entire thing is this. Well, if your brain can cause that, can your brain not cause back pain? Can your brain not cause your knee to hurt? Can your brain not cause anxiety? Of course it can. And so I, I would highly recommend everyone to check out that book. And I'm going to give you a major tip right now. If you do that search and just do for PDF, it's basically free. It's There's plenty of free PDFs of that book out there. And I don't think that's by... I don't think that's happenstance. You I think... Th- I, you don't think it's accidental? Yeah, I think Sarno... Wanted that. Yeah, very yeah. freely wanted that book to be available and he's got several others that are that are past that also and also to give a shameless plug to my podcast everyone if you want to if you want uh uh to get an interview or hear an interview firsthand with a doctor who practices that medicine exclusively check out my episode with dr howard schubiner who is one of the foremost practitioners of mind body medicine he's a doctor in detroit michigan did you do a phoner with him yes i did what episode number is that do you remember? oh gosh it's it was in the 70s or 80s man okay. so um episode number 70s or 80s we yeah were, we were not some, podcasting in the 70s and 80s yeah right, right. it's so it's some, so yeah they just check out the drummers weekly groovecast episode with dr howard schubiner it's one of the most listened to episodes that i have that's interesting yeah. So anyway, getting back to my story. So I read that book and then and I Mukta is going to tell you and, and yeah. And then if I ever had any problems, call Mukta and she was going to tell you that you're fine. And um, essentially, I might just call her anyway. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful lady. Yeah. Um, so essentially, Patrick, I started practicing the things that were in that book right. at that time. And I started adopting that philosophy that I told you at the very beginning, that that very broad based philosophy of, you know, it's the voluntary assumption of personal personal responsibility. It's the old biblical idea of pick up your cross and bear it. Right. You know, that sort of thing was essentially what it is, man. And 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 basically, you know, when I started practicing that and when I started doing these different things that I knew that I needed to be doing and I started actively journaling journaling I started doing the things that I needed to now know you, you meditate we yes I absolutely that. meditate I practice, practice yoga I practice yeah. yoga as well I meditate uh, it, the the forms of mindfulness that that any form of mindfulness you can take is going to be nothing but beneficial okay you know and uh, I actively free write journal uh, when, and, when do and you do that in the morning? Any time that I feel like it. Uh huh. When you say feel like it, is it a moment of inspiration of like I feel like mm-hmm. I should write in my journal, yes. or is it like I'm really not 
doing good right now. I should sit down and write. It's both. Yeah? It's both. And and I, I had some of those moments this past week, man. I, I've got a... Mm-hmm. And and let me say this: sometimes anxiety is not brought upon by bad things. Sometimes, man, you can just have a whole lot of good things going on at I the was same time. Talking to Tyranny uh, Tough in interview number two, uh, episode number two of this podcast about procrastination being about fear of not just failure but of success, like being afraid to start the work because the penalty for failure is so high. But also, the amount of responsibility that comes with success can also cause anxiety mm-hmm. like it's mm-hmm. what do you do with the journals when you're done with them do you keep them or throw they... them out really done just patrick i have filled up i can't even tell you how many spiral bound notebooks man that i filled up front and back page man just take them and throw them out because essentially what you're doing man uh what i learned from guru sahai and what i learned from sarno is that you are essentially m- making your conscious mind aware of repressed emotions primarily rage primarily rage is what you're expressing in these journals and then other repressed emotions will find their way out and the key is is don't think about it man just sit down and start writing this is really interesting to me because it's like three four questions i want to ask you all at once let me try not to derail you too much because i no, hate it when podcasters that's do fine that. number one when you started journaling and this practice did you find that you were finally mourning the death of your father for real for the first time that's part of it i had a tremendous amount of guilt about this one particular time man i'll never forget it pat never forget it and i'm still getting over it man there was one time right before he passed that he was unable to speak he was traked he was unable to speak it but he was laying in a bed in the hospital and i was at the foot of the bed and he winked at me and and it was one of those things, man, to where I didn't necessarily return the wink. You know? Yeah. I mean, I had a lot of guilt about that. How old were you? 11 or 12. Yeah. 11 probably at that time. You know, an unbelievable amount of guilt over something like that. And yeah, that's a lot to carry. It is. And I, and I mean, I, I'm, I'm literally still getting over it. I mean, I, I'm past it, of course. Right. You know? Uh, but I mean, I, you know, I have guilt about, you know, everybody has guilt about those kind of things. Right. Well, I, we, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. We all have opportunities to do the right thing that we miss purely out of not realizing how important those moments are going to be later. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how could you know at 11, you know, what comes back to you? Yeah. You then find out later on, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, the only thing you can do is just promise to be more aware in the future. And yeah. Try to be present. Yeah. Try, absolutely. Try to be present. And then again, man, be, man, being grateful. Yeah. Oh my God, man. That cures a lot of ills, man. Also, I, I guess, you know, the sort of the dragon that I'm chasing through the course of my own work on myself, the thing that I still haven't quite mastered is, is mastering the explosive temper. And, man, that's just, mm-hmm. um, uh, it's a constant companion of mine. It's that repressed rage, man. Yeah. Well, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I wondered if meditation would help with it or, uh, well, it helps somewhat that free journaling, man, is, is a good thing. And, and let me tell you, man, you too, man, come you, you and I both come from that Scots Irish background. Right. We're also drummers. It's our job to hit stuff. Yeah. If I Mm -hmm. hit my head on a cabinet door, man, that cabinet door has to die. You know, something that I discovered about myself also is that, and, and I don't know, it might ring true with yourself also, but, you know, I come from that Scots-Irish Appalachian background that is essentially a culture of honor. Yes. And, man, that com- the rage comes with the badge right. in that. Keep talking. Yeah, and essentially, I mean, you know, the entire thing, when we talk about a culture of honor, and, and I, again, I'm going to give you a quick and dirty yeah, let me uh, explanation it. of it, right? But I mean, you, you certainly need to, people who are listening to this, if you want to get more into it, definitely check it out. You know, there's a great book by a sociologist named Dr. Richard Nesbitt, and it's called Southern Culture, or it's, it's something, the Southern something in the culture of honor, where it talks about why there's so many killings and why the South is so violent, you know, and why there's, you know, you've always had the Hatfields and the McCoys and all these different types of violent things that happen in Appalachia. Right. And essentially what it is is this, is that, the Scots Irish and the people who live in the rural South, we have been 
uh, taught this culture of honor. And essentially what it is is it goes all the way back to the times of people who lived in Scotland and in Ireland and who were sheep herders and, you know, lived out in the wilderness and there was really no justice or there was really no police protection or, or government style protection. And so we had to take everything on our own yeah. to take. So if, you know, if somebody came in and stole your sheep, you had to basically go protect your honor from that. If somebody right. insulted your mother, somebody, you know, raped your sister or something like that. You know, it was something of an honor that you had to go and you had to protect it. And, and it was, you had to protect your own honor, your own dignity, you know, that right. sort of thing. And that's, we still have that. I mean, we still have that. When I talk to people about firearms ownership, it's hard to explain to people when you live rurally, like I do. Yes. If the, something is happening, uh, the, the, the thing that I always hear old Southern guys say is uh, when seconds count, the police are just minutes away. Exactly. You know, and yeah. that sounds like a very similar. The first time I saw the schism between Southern culture of honor and the chivalric code, I've also heard it referred to, and people blowing off steam uh, in the Northeast. I was in New York City. I was on tour. I was 20, mm -hmm. you know. I think we were playing CBGBs, and um, it was like 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. We finished our showcase, and we were getting ready to go stay somewhere. And I saw this guy leaning into the window of a cab shouting you cabbies are unbelievable like yeah just offloading on this guy i was like those dudes are gonna fight mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then they didn't and it was a huge mystery to me i was like how do you get that mad at somebody you don't you don't physically assault them you know and it's a cultural difference. Like Absolutely. the guys in my band are all from New York. Mm -hmm. Dan, Mike, 5'8", all those guys are all New Yorkers. And they were like, why would you hit him? You've already yelled at him. I was like, okay. And I, it's always been like one of the great cultural schisms in that band is that I tend to have a, little bit more of a, a lot more of a temper and a lot more direct physical relationship with anger than they do. Oh. But, and I think that this ties into this thing we're talking about. Patrick, I still fight down 10 rednecks every day. You know, in, in myself, you know, right. that's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, it's the, you're yeah. wrestling the tin lumberjack rednecks yeah. in, in your soul. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but I mean. It's toxic, man. It yeah. kills people. Mm -hmm. You know, it uh, it ages people. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, unfortunate. But, man, I've got to gotta find a better solution than, than punching cabinet doors. Read the book. Okay. <laughs> so your current daily practice mm -hmm. is to do yoga. Yep. Meditate. Yep. Journal. Yep. And um, when you're sort of journaling and you're hitting these like negative emotions, these frustrations that you have with people around you, how do you manifest that? I mean, is this one of those Henry Lukacs things? You know Henry Lukacs? No, I don't. He's the his concentration camp survivor who's, Ooh, you don't have any control yeah. over external events, only your own reaction to them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you, one of the keys is to write in the most emotional terms as you possibly can. And, and again, you got to use these words that you may never say or verbalize. Mm -hmm. And again, just putting them on paper is not as easy as it says or as easy as it sounds, yeah. right? Man, it is painful to write some of these things out, even on paper that you know that no one else is ever going to read and you're going to eventually throw away. But you need that one of the keys is to write the stuff out as rawly and emotionally as you possibly can. And while we're at it, let me say this. The other key is you don't type this stuff out on a computer. You take pen in hand, put it on paper. The okay. transferal of that from brain down to the arm, to the hand, to the writing instrument, to the paper is crucial. Yeah. That sort of parallels. I remember... Uh, one of the, my early writing instructors when I was in college talked about mechanical writing a lot, like just get it done, mm -hmm. just just spin it out. So how long have you been sort of in this routine? The journaling yeah. uh, and the, practicing the Sarno stuff, man, about 2011. So almost a decade, I mean, mm -hmm. seven years, eight years. Yeah, I've never been better also. I mean, that's not to say that that, that the occasional anxiety provoking thing doesn't come up it absolutely does right but man let me tell you i think significantly more psychologically about it now than i do just physically right because you know one of the interesting things is 
back before my enlightenment, so to speak, right. you know, when you start having these physical symptoms, I mean, you're always looking for some sort of a cause phys- that caused the physical thing. You're not thinking of psychological. And essentially what that does is that just manifests it, makes it worse. It turns it into a more, you know, like a vicious cycle. That's really, uh, I've, this has been a really revelatory conversation for me and it, 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 it's given me a lot to think about and a lot of work to do. I'm really grateful for it. Oh man, I I am delighted, man, to talk about it. I'm incredibly passionate about this. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, well, and it's hard to argue with the level of success you've had in your personal and professional life since 2007. I, I not to say, I don't want to say that I agree, but I I do agree, man. I, I've I've never been more productive. I've never been happier about what I'm doing, uh-huh. and I've and let me say this also, man. I've never been more convinced in my life about the relevance of what I'm doing also. Right. I, I mean, I am, I, I've always thought that I've been a good player. I've always thought that I've been a good teacher. That pales into what I'm doing now, man. I yeah. am so confident in what I'm doing, especially from the teaching standpoint. That I feel so good about what I'm doing right now. Yeah. And that that that's one of the reasons, man, why I've spent so much time over the last year or so actively seeking out, uh, you know, teaching on the post secondary level again. Opportunities to, yeah. s- to serve. Right. Exactly. So, one of the things that we do here at the Crash and Ride podcast is as we're winding down, I have now six questions. It started as five. That sounds vaguely familiar, yeah. Patrick. It's not actually. Uh, I stole it <laughs> originally from Bernard Pivot, the um, yeah. uh, the the famous ten questions that uh, James Lipton uses at the end. Of, right. Um, but I, I love the way you guys finish up too. Um, uh, mine are a little more pedestrian, um, but I think uh, when I ask these questions, the idea is to to sort of make fairly general questions, and you can ask me to narrow down criteria if you want but i'm more interested in your instinctive response okay to them so uh question one uh what is your favorite meal that you've ever had oh, wow man man it's not something you sit around thinking about every day but to me it gets very essentially at what what we value yeah one of the favorite meals i've ever had uh, and that I would look forward to again is there's a great little farm to table restaurant uh, that's one of uh, ironically Alton Brown's or it was his favorite restaurant in Marietta called the Butcher the Baker. Uh-huh. Oh my God, man! I had a farm to table thing there one time that was unbelievable, and it was a pork belly with Southern Chow Chow on top. Man, you're singing my song. It's unbelievable. That man. sounds amazing. I'm gonna go with that. Okay. Um, the second question um, is, what is the most frightened you've ever been? Um, the most frightened I've ever been, I thought I was dying in the lobby of CarMax. Uh, <laughs> CarMax, the car dealership. Yeah, the car dealership in Morrow, Georgia, in the summer of 2000. I was having a panic attack. I, a panic attack. I was buying a car yeah. down there, and I walked out to my car to get the deed, you know, so I could transfer it over to tra- to, to trade it. And I thought I was dying. I stopped, froze in the middle of the car dealership with a, the title of the car in my hand. Stood there for probably a minute. Thought I was dying. Did anybody else notice your distress? Nope. How did it manif- How did it resolve itself? Uh, I basically let it pass after about a minute, enough to where I could continue walking. <laughs> you know. Jesus Christ. And I walked back into the salesman's office and completed the transaction. That's amazing. It was awful. Terrible. What car did you get? It was a Camry. It's for my wife. <laughs> it was a great car. <laughs> it is a great car. Yeah. Mm. That sounds uh, remarkable that you could be walking through life on any given moment and someone nearby could be having the worst moment of their entire life. And you I'm so cognizant of that now. Yeah? Do you, yeah. Have, you, have you helped anybody? Have yes. You, Oh yes. How do you? What is the? What do you say to them? Well, first off, man, if it's somebody that's in like acute panic like that, uh-huh. you know, I first off I'll relate to them. I'll go, brother or sister, I'm right there with you. 
Right. What in the world can I do, if anything, to help you right now? Even if it's, can I get you a chair? Can I get you some water? And let's breathe. Let's yeah. you and I breathe for a second. How about that? You know? Yeah. That's an incredibly kind thing to do. Yeah. And, and also, another thing, man, that I take an incredible amount of passion and pride over, man, is I have very under the table, very kind of clandestinely uh, extended, um, I'll call it drum lesson service, so to speak, to there are a few um, players, some prof- quite well-known professionals <laughs> that have had some severe chronic physical pain while playing Yeah, that I have help them with you think it's a manifestation of some i know it is you know it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah because i mean some uh, they're like it, it man they'll come in and just have pristine technique and pristine positioning and stuff behind the drums and it's like it's gotta be the way that i'm hitting and it's gotta be the setup and i'm like well maybe maybe not you huh. know and and i'm like if you'll just give me a little bit of time on this right i can fix you that's really cool. Yeah. Um, third question. Yeah. Uh, what is the thing that you've lost that you regret the most? Mm. These are not light questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are some aspects of my kids of their childhood where I've neglected being the parent that I wanted to be. So the loss of the opportunity to be mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How old are your kids now? Well, they're all across the board, Patrick. Right, you've got a newborn. Yeah, seven months. yeah. Uh, but but eighteen and twenty or nineteen and twenty one, respectively. Where do, where do they live? Uh, they're in Atlanta. They go to yeah. school at Kennesaw. Yeah, they're up there. And and you know one of the things also, uh, they're not going to listen to this. But it's not like I tell them any. I tell them all the time this this thing. I said if there's one thing they'll and I said if there's one thing that I wish because they'll ask me what I want for my birthday. What do you want for Christmas? What do you want for Father's Day? And you know what my answer is every single time. And they always they go okay. The the answer is is I want you to ask me questions. Ask me questions about things about what you should be doing and what you know please ask me questions because i said you wouldn't believe how many kids your age come to me and ask me that how many other adults i have that come and ask me that yeah. ask me questions you know you know one of my greatest fears in life is that i'm gonna die and my daughter's not gonna have the ability to ask me questions as she gets older mm-hmm. i'm an older parent you're an older parent yeah. now mm-hmm. i worry man that's a terrible fear of mine that She's gonna get old, and she's gonna like have to 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 buy a house and not yeah be able to ask yeah that what is mm-hmm. a, what is what is mortgage insurance? Well, you know, I've already outlived my father from the standpoint of how old his kid, you know, his youngest kids were, you right. know, from that standpoint. Yeah, and you know, I and let me say this: the whole thing of you know my routine of this thing of you know practicing mindfulness and yoga and the journaling and all this other stuff, and it it. it of course has to do with my own health, but I mean, it has to do again with the health of these, the kids to having a father to talk to, you know, and to, so believe me, man, that's in my mind as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, what is your favorite place to gig? Oh man. And, and let me tell you, I, can I, can I do one international and one domestically? Sure domestically man and this sounds so weird because it's right down the street i love 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 playing at the tabernacle in atlanta yeah it is one of the finest venues in the world and it's in the backyard and the crew there is just choice man they are some of the best crew in the world people who worked at the tabernacle now internationally man i actually have a few but i'm going to i'm going to say that Lima, Peru is I've, way up there. I've never been there. Hard to find a better audience, man. And and some wonderful venues there as well. I've been there five times. No kidding. Yeah. With, I've, with who? With Bill, whom? Bill and Shell Trio. He's a jazz pianist based out of Seattle. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. That sounds like a really choice gig. Incredible. It's 30 kinds of potato in Peru. 
It's a big selling point <laughs> also, for me. Also, thir- 30 kinds of potato at the Baked Potato in downtown <laughs> Los Angeles, California. <laughs> Go check that out. Yeah, great little, I've, great I've, little jazz venue. I've I've heard recordings from there. I've never played mm-hmm. baked potato. Yeah, um, that's pretty much all they serve is baked potato. It's, mm-hmm. it's pretty comprehensive. You can do a lot. Know. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Um, all visa uh, considerations and income considerations aside, mm-hmm. if you mm-hmm. could live anywhere, where would you live? That's a good one too, man. That's a really good one. A surprising number of people have said, "I, I like my spot. I like yeah. where I'm at." I, I I do like my spot, but man, I have and and. Let me say this for years and years and years, I would have probably said I love downtown Boston. Uh, I love San Francisco. Um, Let me tell you what I'm going to say, because now I'm becoming an old man, Patrick Ferguson. Yes. Um, I'm going to go a little bit south of San Francisco and I'm going to say Monterey Bay area. It's beautiful. there. That's where the Lord lives. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Man, the the climate there and just the the scenery and everything is, it's just absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the weather and everything else there. The mm-hmm. cost of living is outrageous, but part of the question is like, just assume you have all the money in the world. Or Co- cost of living is criminal out there. Exactly enough money, I should say. Mm-hmm. And this is the new question. I came up with it in the middle of the last interview. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, it's question number six. Eventually, this list will probably be ten questions. But number six is: What is your perfect instrument, and do you own it? Mm. Mm. I got some good stuff, Patrick. You, you know that. Man. I've, I've seen your Gretches, and I love those drums. Yeah, natural maple. Let's talk about the kit that you play all the time. You got That's, it's in the car. It's going to a gig, man. Got, as soon as I. 18, 20, and 22 kick drums in this, uh-huh, right? Uh-huh. It's Maple Gretsch. Yeah. You have 12, 13, oh, oh, well, 14, 16. No, no. You underestimate me, Ferguson. Yeah. I have 8, 10, <laughs> 2 12s, 13, <laughs> 2 14s, 15, 16, and 18. And a 6 and a half by 14 matching snare. Outstanding. Yeah, but is, you but know is what? That your dream kit, though, is that like man, the end of it's, the road? It'll flat out work, man. I'll yeah. tell you that. There's not many people gonna g- would come down on that and say it's not. Um, it's up there. But let me tell you something, man. That I am incredibly infatuated with right now, and it's a symbol. Okay, man. I've got a 22 inch Istanbul Agop 30th anniversary we're, symbol. We're sitting in a room yeah. with. Six Istanbul yeah. Agop symbols in my yeah. kit. Yeah, that is one of the finest pieces of metal, man. You'll ever hear in your life. I believe it. Those are great symbols. Yeah. So, man, it's almost a tie between that and those Gretches. Did you try a bunch of the those symbols before you settled on that one, or was this yeah. like it came yeah. in the mail? I, I've right, heard right. I've heard a many of them, but this one came in the mail. Really? Mm-hmm. That's that's. I mean, to be able to just like call Scott. It is yeah. symbol and say send me a symbol and then get your dream symbol is a pretty amazing feat. That crash symbol right there behind your head, radio listeners, you can't see the symbol. Um, yeah. There's a 20 inch trad crash right there that's the best sounding crash symbol I've ever played. And I'm afraid to take it out of the house now because if it ever breaks, I'm going to have to lie under my desk for a week. Cause I, I, I understand that, man. But I mean, sometimes you have to let those doves fly free, man. You know, it's not easy, man. I love that symbol. So, and I've had like engineers, you know, and symphon- these gigs I play with them mm-hmm. with the Mike Mills band. We're in these symphony halls and I've had the engineer come to me after the show and say that that symbol right there. I need you to tell me where I can get one of those. I'm like, I, good luck. Istanbul Agop. I'm a spo- I, I'm I'm a I'm a endorser and they mm-hmm. sent me that symbol. And yeah, it, it's easily the best sounding crash symbol. I've ever whoever, had. whoever was in charge of sending those out, man, like in. I don't know. It knows what he's listening for. She, yeah, what she's or listening for. Either yeah. that, or they're just all really, really like their their baseline is above average, and then yeah. occasionally you just get one that's world class. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, cool. Mm-hmm. This has been unbelievably great. Well, I'm man, super grateful. I oh, well, I'm incredibly passionate about it. And let me tell you, just as a side note as well, sitting here again talking to you about it is a form of therapy that I love. I love doing it, man. It's it's valid. It helps me, man, as well. And so if it helps anybody else, man, I'm I'm just delighted because that's I'm 
again, here to serve, man. I, I really do believe that's part of my pathway forward as well. Sure. And, you know, if anybody wants to get in touch with me as well, maybe Patrick, you can put some things in the liner notes, send sure. them over to the website, you know, and we'll they do. can reach out to me because, again, I have plenty of listeners to the other podcasts that, that reach out as well. So delighted to have, do that. Does the Sarno book talk about journaling? And then Yes. Okay, great. So that's really, it all sort of starts there and you can get everything you need from, tell me the name one more time. It's Healing Back Pain Healing by Dr. Back John pain. Sarno. But if you if you just go to, for example, Amazon and you just put in Dr. John Sarno, he's got about four books that are out. Right. Start with that first one, Healing Back Pain, and then you can read the others. And the others are really just just uh, kind of the furthering of that notion and the furthering of that modality. Man, thank you so much. My pleasure. All right. Man, a, a lot of great information there. Thanks again so much to Phil. Um, and uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, thanks to our, our monthly Patreon sponsors. You guys are are, are making this possible, and I'm, I'm deeply in your debt. Um, as we said before, if you're in distress and you're thinking that you need to talk to someone, you're having a tough time, you're contemplating hurting yourself, um, make sure you have this number handy. It's the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 1-800-273-8255. There's no need to keep that stuff in and suffer uh, alone. Uh, reach out, form a community of people around you if you can. Um, shoot us an email if you feel like at crash and ride at protonmail.com. Remember, loud guitars save lives. Stick around. Thanks. Bye.